Yeah, hi, uh, it's Roger here. I'm going to do a video for you on being done in by the media. First of all, as probably people know, the media don't exist to give objective, reasonable news. The first thing we need to understand about the media is that they exist to make money. And if it means saying something untruthful makes money, then they'll say something untruthful in order to make money. And the second thing, of course, is they're not ideologically neutral. Just about all the press is controlled by big corporations, and big corporations have an ideology of maintaining the social, the social, the status quo. So that's the starting point of this video. And I don't know where people live who are watching this video, but in the UK we have this phrase called, which goes. Um, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. <laughs> and the mad thing is, of course, is we do, don't we? You know, you can't help it. You, you read something and you go, oh my God, you know, that's happening because you just get pulled in. And that's what we're going to look at in this video is how you get pulled in, how this happens and, you know, what to do about it. So first of all, we're going to go through the different ways in which this happens. And then more interestingly, we're going to look at what to do about it, because there's a lot you can do about it, as I found out. And that brings me on to the point, of course, is I don't personally have, you know, expertise in this area, but I've been thrown into it over the last two years because I'm an interesting case study, as you might say, because, you know, I've had all this stuff said about me and I'm going, what? <laughs> So we're going to have a look and use myself as a little case study. But obviously this happens to lots of other people and this video isn't really about me. It's about what will happen to anybody who basically stands up and says the truth in society and what happens to those people and why people try and do them in and, you know, as I said, what to do about it. All right, so I'm going to give you a bit of background information. We're going to look at this subject of propaganda to start off with. Propaganda is this key concept behind manipulation and for a lot of people the main guy here is called Bernays and he was around in the middle of the last century and what Bernays was saying is you can use information in order to make people feel like they have to consume things. He was the big marketing guy and he developed all these different ways to manipulate people to feel like they have to go out and do shopping and if they didn't, you know, they weren't proper people and all that stuff. And what's interesting is Bernays was, was taking sort of ideas from an older propaganda tradition and propaganda traditionally or originally was very much about war, was about how to manipulate people to mobilise them to go and get killed. So that's like one way of looking at propaganda. Another way of looking at it is this work that this guy did. He's called Elu, I think that's the way you pronounce him. So this guy was saying there's two main things that happen in propaganda. There's two main things you're trying to do. And again, you can, you, you can catch yourself doing this when you read something or you watch something. So first of all, does a trigger, does an emotional trigger that makes you go... Oh, you know, really? You know, and, and then there's another sort of move which reinforces that and makes you think, well, that's terrible, a sort of judgment, you know, I'm right and that person's wrong and I have to stand up for what's right. So there's these two things in combination, the sort of emotional trigger and this, emotion, this moral reaction, this is what is, is reinforcing the reaction that the propaganda is aiming to get at. Okay, and, and this connects with the idea of divide and rule, which is, you know, the oldest trick in the book, which is to try and get some people to turn against other people. And this is what the rich and powerful have been doing for a very long time, of course. And to expand on this, what seems to happen is, is this emotional trigger is to stop people from thinking about things in a nice, considered way. You find this 
in a lot of the media, the idea is to just get you to have that emotional reaction and just to see things from one side and then to reinforce it. So you're not sitting here going, you know, well, maybe there's that or maybe there's that. You're just sucked in to this outrage sort of feeling, you know, really? And then that's really terrible. And what this does, of course, is the victim, as you might say, the person it's directed to, everyone thinks they're a terrible person, or at least some people do, because that's the divide and rule mechanism. And what this does is the person that's standing up doing the truth telling is pushed down and victimized and manipulated so that they become a terrible person. And people on their own side turn against them because they've heard something terrible. And before you know it, the person doesn't is destroyed. And, and that has the effect of stopping people from stepping up and telling the truth. So this isn't a little thing, right? It's a massive way in which the powers that be prevent political change. And what we've got to do, and what we're going to talk about in this video, is ways in which this happens and ways in which we can encourage and support people to, to step up into positions of power and, and spokes, you know, spokespeople, people that will speak to the press and how that, that's going to work. Because this is vital, right? This isn't a little thing. I know I'm repeating myself, but what I'm trying to say is, is if you're going to build a social movement, you need orators, right? You need spokespeople, you need leaders, you need people who don't have formal power, but will encapsulate what the values are and the rationale and the emotion and the righteousness of your cause. And if you don't do that, then everyone's just looking at the, the media, telling them to sit there and consume or you know, watch Netflix because it's locked down, you know what I mean? So, so that comes on to me, okay? So you've got Roger Hallam. So this is phrased, the infamous, Rod, infamous Roger Hallam, right? I've read that somewhere. So this is the case study I'm going to look at, is myself. And again, like, I'm not saying this video is about me. I'm just going to take my example because it's what I know quite a lot about. Okay, so tactic number one. So this is called Context Omni or quote mining. So this is a really major shaboodle that the press does. And it's extremely effective because you can't really tell what's going on. But the general gist is they'll do an interview with you and then they'll quote mine, they'll look through it and pick out a little three second clip and then they'll take it out of context and stick it in as a headline. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here, right? So I did a one and a half hour interview with a German newspaper, corporate owned German newspaper. One and a half hour interview covering a whole range of topics, lots of lively conversation, lots of argument. And they took three seconds out of one and a half hours. And those three seconds were the Holocaust is just another fuckery, right? Which, if you think about it for a moment, sounds like it's part of an argument, right? It's an interchange. But if you take it out of context, you can make it into, blow it up into some massive anti-Semitic, you know, anti-Holocaust, relativization situation. Now, of course, the newspaper is not going to publish the whole interview because if you read the whole interview, you'll find out that's exactly the opposite of what I was arguing, which is that genocides are beyond obscene and the genocide that's coming down the road and is already happening in the global south is going to be the most terrible episode of human suffering in, in our history. That's what I was trying to put across in the interview. But there's nothing about that. It's simply there to be manipulated in order to make me look anti-Semitic to make me look like I'm relativizing the Holocaust and all the rest of it. But there's another way of taking out the context, which is to take the person out of their context. So what people don't realize was that interview was done on my farm. I'm a Welsh farmer. I spent 20 years working with agricultural laborers who swear, you know, in every sentence. 
that's my culture. You know, when I come on video, I try and behave myself. <laughs> but when I'm out there in the fields, you know, cropping carrots, it's fuck this, fuck that, because that's how people speak in my culture, the culture of the work that I do. So that's not, there's no consideration of that. You'd, and this happens all the time, of course, particularly with, you know, people from oppressed cultures, working class cultures, who use a different language and then it's put into what you might call a professional middle class media context and people are ridiculed or mocked because they're using their own language or their own accent and what have you. So this is another way in which the press manipulates particularly people that have very little power. And I just want to draw one or two ways in which this specifically works out. One of the phrases here is, appears to downplay the Holocaust. So they're being sneaky here because they know they can't totally get away with it because they can't substantiate it. But if they put appear in, it's a bit like, well, you know, you're just suggesting this, and this is the divide and rule mechanism. You know, it's, it's, it's very insidious because you don't really see the appears. All you see is downplaying the Holocaust. Really? You know, emotional reaction, moral reaction. You know, these events are regular events in history. Now, if, if you put that into the context, what you know, what I'm talking about there is regular events in the history of humanity, right? I'm not talking about every two or three years. I'm talking about the whole of humanity. But if you take it out of context, it's a bit like, oh, I'm downplaying the, you know, the Holocaust is a bit like, you know, 20 people died in a terrorist attack. You know, it, it's, it manipulates it by taking it out of, of, of context. So the last one is, like, he has been denounced by his own movement. Now, this is even more insidious because what, what, what the press do is they say what the movement is saying. Well, first of all, how do you know the movement thinks this? I mean, have you asked them all? And, and secondly, by saying this happens, then everyone thinks it has happened and then it sort of has because everyone's going, well, if they're denouncing him, then we should denounce him as well. So you have this sort of herding mechanism that the press manipulates the movement by saying what the movement thinks to the movement. And then the movement is going, oh, is that what we think? Well, you know, maybe we need to, you know, get rid of this guy. And this is the classic divide and rule mechanism. The other thing you need to be clear about is there's a lie that's being created that I sent a memo to XR before the interview to say that I was going to use the interviews to cause disruption. And the fact of the matter is that the memo went out after the interview. And the fact of the matter is that I went into that interview as I go into all interviews intending to tell the truth as I believe it to be. I don't go into an interview intending explicitly to manipulate the interview. So that's another way in which you get an extra layer of manipulation. Not only are you taking it out of context, but then you create a lie around what the intention was. And of course, it's very difficult to disprove intentions. But all I can say to you is, you know, I swear on my children's lives, I did not go into that interview in order to cause disruption around making comments about the Holocaust, period. So that's the situation. So the second example is sort of slightly hilarious, dare I say it. And that's this interview I did with this young journalist. And he was asking about moral responsibility for, you know, what the moral consequences and legal consequences should be for people that have been responsible for putting carbon into the atmosphere. So I had a nice, you know, academic conversation with him. And my conversation was along the lines of, if the political class does not respond appropriately and responsibly to the climate catastrophe, then we're going to have social collapse. And in social collapse, people get violent. And that means that some people get bullets through their head. Now, saying that as a sociologist of political change, there's nothing controversial about that. It's political history. Most days when I get out of bed, I'm saying people that are culpable are people that run society, run big business, run governments, run the elites. Okay. And they are exponentially more culpable to the extent that the climate catastrophe 
becomes more clear. Okay, all right. So, 1990, you might as well, you know, give him six months in prison now, maybe you should put a bullet for that. <laughs> okay. Or, or, or rather, someone probably will. What I made clear in that interview was, that's not what I think is the right thing to do. That's, I'm just making a prediction. And what I think is people should engage in civil resistance, non-violent civil resistance, which doesn't, dare I say, put, mean putting a bullet through people's heads. Now, what the media does, of course, is to take that out of context and says, Roger Hallam want, wants to put bullets through the head. You know, I think there's a funny picture of me. So it's all blown up. And so the specific move here is to take a, a description of something or a prediction and translate it into something you want to see. And this, is, this happens to a lot of public figures. It's a standard routine. But it's completely ridiculous, right? You know, people make predictions all the time. It doesn't mean you want them to happen, you know. So this is another classic example of taking out of context, manipulating it, blowing it up with lots of pictures of, what is it, you know, Soviet dictators or whatever. <laughs> and it's a bit like, oh, really? You know, and again, for the record, just to put the record, the fact of the matter is, you know, I... I've been involved in social movements since I was 15. I'm an absolutely committed to non-violence. I was involved in the peace movement. That's where I cut my teeth. I've done five years of research at King's College in London about civil resistance, civil disobedience, non-violent direct action. That's what I'm about. Everyone knows that's what I'm about. But, you know, the press have a bit of a quiet news day and they go, how can we manipulate this to make some money? Hence the picture you can see. Okay, but we're moving on to name calling now. So name calling covers a multitude of sins, right? And this has got a long, you know, pedigree of unpleasantness, to be euphemistic about it. So if you read political history, what you know is in the past, um, name calling was a primary way of silencing people and removing them from the public eye. You know, that person's X, and that X, the X is made as something that's beyond the pale. And in the early part of the century, right up to 1989, actually, the big word was communist, to, you know, in, in the West. It was like, that guy's a communist, you know, no evidence. And suddenly everyone goes, well, I'm not going to say that person isn't a communist because I might be looked upon as a communist. So everyone's like terrified. And suddenly it becomes official, that person's a communist. And, and then it happened the other way around with the left calling someone a fascist. You know, if you don't agree with the far left, then you're a fascist. And everyone goes, oh my God, the person's a fascist. And then no one wants to go, well, I don't think he is, you know. <laughs> it doesn't look like one to me. But everyone's going, well, better not say that because I'm going to be called a fascist as well. So this is a awful and terrible way in which you create a closed, undemocratic, totalitarian S culture. And, and in the modern period, of course, you know, in the last few years, the big sort of ostrification word is anti-Semitic, particularly in, in Europe. And as soon as someone says you're anti-Semitic, everyone's like, you know, so as, as, as we know from the previous example, you know, you have a comment and then the comments, the comments interpreted as being anti-Holocaust and then you take the next step, which is if you're anti-Holocaust, then you must be anti-Semitic or the, or the phrase is anti-Semitic, implication is you're anti-Semitic and then before you know it, no one wants to talk to you. So, you know, I got invited to go and talk to some Labour Party activists up in the north of England and I arrived and no one was there. <laughs> I was going, well, that's interesting. And they were going, oh, yes, because they're worried about being associated with someone that's being called anti-Semitic because of a three-second quote taken out of a one-and-a-half-hour interview, which has nothing really to do with anti-Semitic behaviour, right? So this is how it works. And the real insidious mechanism on... In, you know, liberal and progressive circles, is racist. So we've got an article here about Extinction Rebellion. If you read it, it's quite clever 
because it doesn't actually say that I'm racist or Extinction Rebellion is racist, but the implication is there. And all you need is the implication. You know, maybe they're not doing something that could be construed, you know, maybe they're doing something that could be construed as racist, and before you know it, it, it travels down the line, and suddenly they're racist because they could be construed. And what we need to understand is this is an act of power, right? You know, this is what the media does, is it creates a, a way of shutting you up, right? This is an act of power. And it's a weaponization. So it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with racism as well. Because the fact of the matter is, anyone can be accused of being racist. You know, you, you can just pick out anything, you know, that's, uh, that, that happens. So looking at this a bit more technically, what happens is you take a string of ideas and you reduce it down to a word. You know, you have something quite complex. You might have a complex analysis in and you choose and manipulate it and say that's racist or well, that's anti-Semitic. Or you're on camera and you're talking to people about some ideas. And again, they just take a little bit out of that and then suddenly that's racist. And again, you've got this idea that, or not this idea, but this phenomenon that once you've been called racist, then lots of people know you're not, but they're all frightened of talking to you and inviting you anywhere. So name calling, that's not great, okay? <laughs> that's why we don't have it in XR, right? You know, no naming and shaming. Why? Because you just end up with this ridiculous sort of arms race, right? Of people calling each other things. And before you know it, everyone's, you know, in some terrible situation. Okay, so the next tactic is um, repetition ab nauseum, right? Which is another, you know, technical way of saying you just repeat and repeat and repeat. And this is related to the other points, you know, the other tactics in many ways. But the idea is, is once you've got hold of the manipulation and name calling or the, the defaming sort of phrase, then you just repeat it over and over again. And this can be done willfully by newspapers and the press. You know, Roger Hallam, infamous, Roger Hallam, racist, Roger Hallam, anti-Semitic, right? And you just repeat it. But in this social media age, this has become even more important because what happens on Google searches and what have you is once you've got a certain, a certain repetition of a word, then that's the word which will come up most often. And so you've got this reinforcement mechanism where people are going, oh, Roger Hallam, look at Roger Hallam. Roger Hallam anti-Semitic or Roger Hallam racist. Oh, he must be. And then they replicate that. And then you get this, this non-linear effect, as it were, that that's what Roger Hallam is because you get reduced. What social media does, as we all know, is it reduces people down to particular phrases and words. Another tactic or another aspect of, of this is whispering campaigns, right? So what we mean by this is some things... You know, it's related to the other points, but something gets put into the public sphere. No one knows where it's come from, and then it spreads. And it's related to this idea of a rumour or an innuendo. So everyone talks about it, and then everyone else is talking about it, and it becomes something real. And the, the way in which it becomes real is because you can't tell who it's come from. And, you know, I'm making this video at the time when I'm in a conflict with uh, global support, international uh, global support, uh, Extinction Rebellion. And what's happening is accusations are being made, rumours are being promoted, but it's from an anonymous statement or it's from people who aren't using their own names. And what that means is you can't ring them up and say, hang on, you know, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Do you want to correct that? Because you don't know who they are. And, and in a way, what Extinction Rebellion Global Support are doing is replicating what the corporate press does, which is they'll say, a source has said something or we've heard something. And then another newspaper will say, well, this is what's happening. And before you know it, you know, you have this repetition and, and um, it becomes, 
you know, a social fact, as you might say, something that people believe. Distraction. So we've got an example here is I was in prison, I had a terrible, you know, conditions. I wrote an article about it, I think. I did some social media about it. I said a whole bunch of really important things about how terrible it is, you know, shit on the toilet and not being let out, you know, for days on end. Just awful things. And then I also mentioned I wasn't getting a vegan diet because I've been a vegan for 34 years and it's nice to have a vegan diet, right? And what happens is it goes into the press. Do they talk about the climate emergency? No. Do they talk about the conditions in prisons? No. What they talk about is Roger Hallam can't get a vegan diet. Distraction, right? And it's a distraction in a particular malicious way. The distraction is to move what's a really important, massively, you know, big crisis into the culture war. Because everyone loves the culture war. Why does the press love the culture war? Because it manipulates people into their little tribal, you know, silos. And as we said originally, it's like emotion and then it's righteousness, you know. Oh, they said that. Oh, then they must be really bad. So it's a bit like, oh, Roger Hallam, privileged, middle class, woke, you know, urban, whatever, you know, is, is getting upset because he can't get a vegan diet. What an idiot, you know. And no checking of the facts, you know. The facts of the matter are, I've actually been a farmer for 20 years, so I'm not really a good candidate for it, you know, working 60 hours a week for a decade or two on very little money. So it hardly makes me a member of the woke urban middle class, just for the record. So the other thing is, the other fact that they don't want to consider, of course, is that actually I wasn't that bothered about having a vegan diet because, surprise, surprise, most food in, in prisons is vegan anyway because they're not going to give you loads of meat. So you get loads of carbohydrates just in case you are interested. So, you know, it was annoying, but it wasn't the main thing, right? The main thing is in COVID, prisoners are treated like shit and that needs publicising. That's what a proper newspaper should do. But they're not doing that because they want to make money out of the culture war. And they don't want to say stuff about the climate crisis because ideologically, they don't want to see things happen about the climate crisis. So this is the distraction. Let's get everyone to be divided and ruled, you know, against each other on all these little trigger things, vegan, you know, middle class woke, all this sort of stuff. Okay, and then a sort of other side of the equation, as you might say, is the appeal to hypocrisy. Now, the great thing about hypocrisy is everyone's a hypocrite, right? You know, you can look at anyone's history and at some point they did something silly that contradicts what they're doing now. And I think there was, I think the, I think the Daily Mail did something on this where, you know, people did some activism and they looked into their past lives and they said, you know, that person is campaigning against climate change and they used to be an uh, air hostess or something, you know, how hypocritical. And, and how this works is there's a three-step process. So, you know, someone says something's true and then what the press does is they find an action that contradicts what that truth-telling is. And then the final step is to say, because that person's a hypocrite, what they're saying is untrue which is entirely illogical, but it sort of works emotionally. You know, like the climate crisis is real, regardless of whether someone used to be an air hostess. That's neither here nor there. But again, you know, coming back to this original point, what the media works on is that emotional trigger, and then you've got you straight into that righteousness. And of course, in a way, you can't win, because coming back to the vegan thing, they could, you know, let's say I wasn't a vegan. Let's say I was a proper, you know, proper builder, macho man type, right? You know, going to prison and I ate meat. You know what the, the, the headline would be? You know, climate activist eats meat in prison. You know, what a hypocrite. Therefore, the climate crisis isn't real. Everyone can relax. We can carry on making money. You know, everything's fine. So whatever 
whatever someone does, they are going to do those two moves. They're going to manipulate you into the culture war or, you know, relatedly, they're going to manipulate you into being a hypocrite. And it's all about distraction from what the real issues are. So that's an outline of what happens, what's happened to me, what's happened to lots of people in the past, and what's going to happen in the future, unless as a movement or as social movements, we could become more savvy in what to do about it. So that's what we're going to look at next. Okay, how to win. Well, my favourite subject. One of the things which you always find with this whole press, moral sort of outrage situation, is these people take themselves enormously seriously. You know, people on the extreme left, the extreme right, the newspapers, these people that are out to get you, they haven't got a sense of humour. <laughs> so the most historically powerful way of undermining, you know, manipulation is not to get sucked into it. You know, do something humorous, use ridicule, use humour. And we've got a little cartoon there about, you know, something that was said about me. And what that does is it breaks up that emotional hardness of, you know, emotional trigger and then righteous reaction. You know, you can't quite maintain that rage, as you might say, against the other if the person that you hate is being light and breezy about it or making a joke of it. It's a bit of a jiu-jitsu move, as you might say, from non-violence theory, which is, you know, you haven't really got the enemy because they're not going to play that game. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a thing for starters, as you might say. If, if you're in a social movement, if you're in XR and you've got a talent or a bit of charisma, you should be up there, right? Because we've talked about this. We need people to take on leadership positions, charisma, you know, oratory. All these things are really important. And if you do that, though, you want to have a team around you, right? Because as soon as you become successful, they're going to come and get you. Uh, as we've seen with myself, and you know, it's nothing personal to me. It's lots of people it's happened to. So you need a team. And they need to support you and they need to be ready to know what's happening and, and know how to react. And th what this team's going to enable you to do is react quickly, right? So speed is absolutely essential. I think this is called rebuttal strategies or something, right? It's got some big word. So in other words, as soon as someone says something that's untruthful, you're out there saying, no, 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 it's not true. Sorry, it's just not true. And if you do it straight away, it doesn't gain that momentum we've talked about. And one of the problems with the Holocaust comments, you know, you see how that's nicely framed, <laughs> you know, the comments that were taken out of context, to be more precise, was I was effectively on my own. I mean, this is a good evidence for why I didn't intend to cause disruption, because it's a bit mad, you know, to charge into making disruption in the Holocaust with no sort of forethought. So what happened in that particular situation is I didn't react quickly. I didn't have any support to speak of. And, you know, what I was told was, oh, you shouldn't say anything because it will make it worse. So then you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You know, if you say, well, this is untrue, people will go, well, that proves, you know, that you're not apologising enough. And then you're an even worse person. And then if you don't apologise or you stay silent, then people go, oh, he's not even responding. So he must be wrong. You know, this is, what's that? What's that play called Salem, you know, the witch hunt sort of routine, you know, if you plead innocence, then you're obviously guilty. And if you're guilty, well, you're guilty, you know, you can't win. So what what the speed thing does is you're straight out there with your team going, no, no, no. You know, that's not what I meant. What I meant was this. Here's the interview. Here's the evidence. Here's the people that are going to support you. You have your little operations sorted out. And what, what you want to focus on is maybe two things, which is who is it that's trying to do you in? You want to identify them. You want to get behind those anonymous, you know, people on social media and actually identify them and name them so that people know who's, who's attacking you. That's the, that's the first thing. And the second thing is you have to assign a motive so people understand that when people are coming to get you, they've got a motive. They're not, you know, when the Zeit newspaper, you know, says terrible things about it, it's got an obvious motive. It doesn't want to have to deal with the idea that 
you know, the German nation is engaged in a genocide project against all future generations. That's not really their ideology, let's put it like that. And it's good money, isn't it? Lots of people are going to look at it. So what you need to be saying is, hang on a minute, what's been said is said by the corporate media. This is how they work. This is how this journalist works. This is how this editor works. This is their record. And people go, oh, right, I get the story now, right? So they've got an alternative frame to, to, to look at. Yeah, and the, the other thing that I personally think is very important is to have the, the power of fearlessness, which is one of my strengths, <laughs> once I get myself going, which is if you come across as defensive and apologetic, I mean, obviously, if you've done something wrong, you should apologise. But if you haven't done anything wrong, you should be fearless about saying, no, I haven't. And if you go into the public sphere and say, no, in a fearless way, then the way in which you're communicating it convinces people. And so it can't really be underestimated, you know, that confidence. And, you know, that takes a while to build up, admittedly. But as you do more interviews, like I've done, I've done about 200 interviews, you know, nowadays I'm going in there and I'm, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> no nonsense. And because I can do that, because I've had the practice and I'm fearless about it, it's very difficult to manipulate that uh, in, in a way in which we've talked about. One of the really terrible things about social media is, and you know, lots of people are talking about this, I think there was a film out recently about it, is how the social media reduces things to sound bites, to pictures, to little phrases, and you get this polarization, you get this dehumanization in, in the public sphere, in you know, in the press. And one of the great things about YouTube, because we're on YouTube, I think, <laughs> the great thing, the big exception with YouTube is you can be on YouTube and you've got three quarters of an hour or three hours or whatever, and you can humanize yourself. So one of the ways we counteract these lies and this reductionism and the polarization is getting on YouTube or getting on Facebook and doing an Ask Me Anything session where you're here and you're saying, come on, you know, give me your worst. And you've got nothing to hide because if you've got nothing to hide, you need to show people that you've got nothing to hide. You know, this is not the truth. And you can have a good chat with people, or, you know, through the Ask Me Anything situation. And, you know, you might be watching this video and you might not agree with everything, but hopefully you'll see, well, you know, Roger Hallam, you know, he's a bit weird and a bit, don't really agree with a lot of what he says, but, you know, he's, he's humanised. I can tell he's a real person. And this count can't be underestimated in terms of creating a democratic culture because democratic culture is about openness and the reason openness is important is because it enables people to connect it's like I really disagree with you but I'm not going to shoot you you know I'm not going to try and do you in because I can say see that you're a human like I am the other thing is is if you haven't noticed yet right saying things in public is scary right I mean, I'm fairly fearless, but it's certainly scary. <laughs> and I was like totally shitting myself when the Holocaust came, comments came out. And that, as I said, that's because I didn't have any support. I didn't know, you know, I was thinking, oh my God, am I, am I anti-Semitic? You know, I was sort of doing myself in even. So what you need to do is if you're going to go into the public realm and we've established that's what people need to do, is you need to have this team and this team isn't just doing technical stuff, you need support, you need other spokespeople to be with you going, you know, that was a great interview or it wasn't such a great interview, but so what, you know, you're building your confidence and you get that emotional support and you're a team and it's not just, you know, Roger going into the heart of darkness stuff. <laughs> um, and this relates to a wider thing, which is you need to educate your movement or, you know, if you're talking about Extinction Rebellion or you know, Burning Pink or whatever progressive or radical movement you're in, you need to educate that movement not to be suckers, right? Not to read, believe everything you read in the newspapers and say, hang on a minute, why are they saying that about one of our spokespeople? Maybe, just maybe, they're wrong. Let's, you know, take a deep breath. Let's not get sucked into all the emotion and the righteous and, oh my goodness, he said that, you know, I'm not talking to him, you know, ban him stuff and think, oh no, no, let's step back a minute because 
we're politically sophisticated to understand that the media is set up through its corporate masters to destroy social movements. And if you think, you know, it's pretty bad at the moment, I can tell you as a sociologist of political change, it gets a lot worse, you know. And as Gandhi said, you know, first of all, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and we've seen a few examples of that, and then they fight you, and the fighting is serious. And then you win, okay? So when they, when it's worth understanding, when they're being particularly nasty to me, or particularly nasty to other people, that's good, <laughs> okay? Because that's, we're close to actually getting them into the fluster where they need to be in order to bring about political change.